And welcome back to part two of the 2014 XYZ Model Financial Statements update. I'm Mark Hucklesby, and without any more ado, let's just see where we've been so far in terms of uh, the session. We've been looking at policy development principles, we've looked at key changes in the legislation, and I've focused on uh, what is new in 2014 and the changes you know, in the accounting you know, standards. We've illustrated them in uh, the XYZ model financial statements. And what I want to do now is um, very much focus on transition and changes and what's new in terms of perhaps uh, showing just the amount of change. In some ways, I feel, you know, a bit like an infomercial uh, commentator. But wait, there's more. But there certainly is more. And without any more ado, let's just get into uh, differential reporting. But before we do, um, I think as we saw in the Commonwealth Games, and uh, you may recall that the red arrows were flying over Glasgow in the uh, early evening as the uh, sun was setting, that it's really important to kind of get the you know, timing right. You know, just like that uh, photographer in the stadium, sometimes it's the right time to kind of get into uh, taking the uh, topic you know, forward. And for some organizations, it'll be sooner. For others, it might be um, a bit later on. But the thing is that you will have to move and, uh, you know, dare I say, push the trigger button on the camera in terms of going forward. And the same is with this transition from differential reporting to RDR. So what really are some of the key points you know, to note? Well, I suppose the first thing to bear in mind is that we are talking about a change in accounting policy, a change in the basis of accounting. And that will need to be reflected in your financial statements. And I think it's important to recognize that NZIFRS 1, which deals with the adoption of IFRS and RDR, is incredibly applicable. And what are some of the, uh, the key changes that we've got? Well, here's a bit of a taster. It uh, is almost a recap of the XRB roadshow presentations that were held. But if these are applicable, then there is work and restatements you know, to be involved. And the first one is uh, you know, very applicable to companies, of course, because uh, you will have to account for deferred tax in accordance with uh, NZIS 12. And uh, that is different from the taxes payable method. There is no shortcut. And uh, when you link that with uh, changes in accounting policy for depreciation and the like, you have some work to do. Then we've got cash flow statements. I suppose the key thing here is that the cash flow statements can be done via the direct method or the indirect method. Remember, New Zealand for the last 20 years has only permitted the direct method. But you can start off with your uh, profit after tax and work up to your operating cash flows and then put in the investing and financing cash flows. But that must come in. Now, under differential reporting, you know, we had this effective concession that you could use the tax rates. And many company accounts that I see actually do have the DV. But what RDR has basically said is no, you've almost got to get back, in fact, you have to get back to where we were with old Kiwi Gap, where really the only basis of depreciation accepted was straight line because it was systematic and reflected the decline in economic potential. Now, that means that you may have to rework you know, depreciation you know, schedules and that will give you temporary differences. So beware of depreciation because those accounting policies may have to change foreign exchange. So just as the tax man requires you to recognize unrealized gains and losses on uh, you know, transactions that have occurred and carry across you know, a balance state, what differential reporting said is no, you can simply work with the um, settlement rate in terms of your accounting. You don't need to recognize those uh, adjustments at each reporting date. Well, that's uh, you know, now moved. And 
We've also seen in terms of construction contracts, and again, this is something that wasn't you know, too common, but uh, you have to use the percentage of completion method. You can't simply say the completed contracts method and recognize all the revenue at the back end. Now, as we will see, completion of contracts method is um, being refined. We see a lot of it in the new standard of IFRS 15, which is to come into you know, the frame. But I suppose it's a case of be careful out there. Borrowing costs must be capitalized if you have a qualifying asset. What is a qualifying asset? Well, it's an asset that takes you know, a significant period to construct. Normally, six months and above, you might be in that frame. So if you're building a warehouse, if you're building a boat or some specialist piece of equipment, then you may end up capitalizing borrowing costs. And IES uh, 23 is quite detailed in how you would go about identifying the rates of interest to be embodied within capitalization calculations. Then we get to impairment. We've got back a uh, situation with uh, uh, intangibles where you had to have indicators of um, impairment before a good uh, impairment test needed to be taken place. Under RDR, with your infinite lived um, intangible brands, goodwill, you have to do it on an annual basis. So it's a not negotiable. And revenue and expenses, well, you could put it um, exclusive for GST. Now you have to uh, go net of GST. Each in their own, perhaps uh, not that material, but when you've kind of got the combo, you can see there are quite a number of moving parts that need to be accounted for when you transition you know, to RDR. And so we've got an XYZ model financial statements, tier one, tier two, and uh, hopefully you will be able to kind of see the differences coming forward. And then we get to NZIFRS and the key differences to IPSAS or Public Benefit Entity IPSAS because remember New Zealand isn't pure IPSAS. We have adapted it for New Zealand in light of basically the adaptations that we made to IFRS. Um, and again, we can talk about these points. They are in their own right and depending on the nature of the reporting entity, incredibly significant. But without doubt, the uh, showstopper, perhaps where most of the conversation will begin, is around identifying and separately identifying revenue from exchange transactions where you pay something and you get something equal in response, as opposed to a non-exchange transaction where you receive money, but you don't necessarily get something in exchange for it. So uh, when governments you know, provide a grant, sometimes it's with conditions, sometimes it's without conditions, and when it's without conditions, then you recognize the revenue immediately. And what this may mean for a uh, number of not-for-profits is that in fact, they end up recognizing more revenue as a result of the transition to IPSAS than they might otherwise have done. IPSAS 23, detailed standard, lots of supplementary guidance being provided by the XRB on that. Um, so watch that space because there's a lot of issues in there. Property plant uh, and equipment you know, revaluations. Uh, again, uh, we've got the tension between IFRS not requiring independent valuer um, as opposed to um, uh, IPSAS, which um, you know, does require you know, some expertise to be uh, brought into the revaluation and where those numbers are sourced from. Consolidations and control. Boy, what a huge issue this is. It's big because uh, if you take, for example, a not-for-profit, their governance regimes are often very different. So we've got not-for-profit number one. Number one has three regions, Auckland, Wellington, and the South Island. They are completely self-governing and there really isn't a national committee that sits above them and provides direction. So those regions, Auckland, Wellington, and South Island, can all be dealt with as three different reporting entities and no further consolidation is required. 
Contrast that with another organization, perhaps uh, they've got a hundred branches up and down the country, but they've got a national committee sitting above them. That national committee can close any one of those hundred branches. In that particular situation, the national committee may have and probably does have control over the operational and financing activities of the entire branch network and therefore that would require consolidation at the national committee level. And there's no way that you can kind of have your sub-region consolidations. Well, you can, but in terms of getting back to the reporting entity concept, it's uh, really important that that be decided. Now, it's a facts and circumstances determination. And for some organizations, you may already have the not-for-profits reporting on a national basis, but there will be many that are not. And it will require some careful consideration, particularly since large registered charities, not-for-profits, will be caught by this new legislation in terms of uh, being required to be audited going forward. Then we've got uh, provisions. Um, I suppose we always had the issue of insurance recoveries with the Christchurch earthquake. Uh, I suppose one of the frustrations under IFRS was that virtual certainty had to be there. You had to have that letter from the insurance company saying, yes, we will give you $10 million to replace that high-rise building. Under IPSAS, you know, insurance recoveries are built around a probability, so it's more likely than less likely. Therefore, the evidence is not quite so, is quite so intense. Related parties. Now, IPSAS really focuses in on related parties. And I suppose it's because so many things can go wrong with related parties. Even if you go to uh, you know, UNESCO's accounts, you find an extraordinary amount of disclosure around related parties, around those involved in governance, the different organizations that they interface with. Yep, that's at the top end of town, but that same principle has to come all the way down into um, IPSAS. And I suppose it's just that um, uh, under IPSAS, uh, we've got uh, some concessions around uh, related party uh, disclosures, but you know, be mindful of those transactions which are not taking place at arm's length and uh, those unusual related party transactions coming forward. Again, there's a very different standard uh, and a way of reporting it and disclosing it um, under IPSAS as opposed to IFRS. Statement of service performance, well, for some organizations, they may have to prepare it for the first time. For those in the public sector, uh, this isn't so new. But what are those um, service performance standards that you are measuring? And remember that the statement of service performance will be subject to audit under the new regime. And statement of cash flows, well, let me not repeat a theme around um, this for many organizations may be new. Heritage assets, uh, we find that uh, IPSAS uh, provides quite a bit more guidance around uh, accounting for heritage assets. It was always a bit of a, a no-go zone for for-profit entities, so you know, be mindful of that. Key management, uh, remuneration and disclosures, again, linked somewhat to related parties, but again, the devil's in the detail here, and uh, it's not just simply IFRS border cost without any reconsideration. Investment in associates, uh, there are some rules regarding you know, losses in associates and um, capping the write down on investments in associates. The rules that exist in the for-profit space with IFRS are different from those from IPSAS. Again, probably not terribly common in many not-for-profits, but if it does impact you, the basis of accounting is different. And similarly, the treatment of uh, if there was a situation of a restructuring and dividends being paid, uh, what's required in IFRS is quite different from IPSAS. So, look, these are just you know, some of the key changes. What I do want to bring to your attention is that there's a 127 page, I think it is, PDF that has been prepared by the XRB that lines up IFRS uh, requirements with the IPSAS 
and explains the implications. So our standard setter has actually done a very detailed analysis and provided an excellent roadmap for transition. Uh, I think the key is to pick that up and use that as a, a basis for going forward in terms of dealing with this conversion. So, you know, look, there are many ways, you know, to deal with, you know, the transition to IPSAS. I suppose at the end of the day is prepare yourself. It is a bit of an endurance. Um, it's not something that can be done kind of eight hours uh, overnight or, um, you know, at the last minute. So, um, you know, like a you know, long distance cycle race, you know, set it. I think it's also important to have some flexibility in the sense of even in publications like XYZ Model for Financial Statements, we won't necessarily have um, all the permutations and combinations uh, provided. Balance. I think, again, let's go back to the conceptual framework. It is focusing on the things that matter and I suppose making sure that uh, there's a logical flow to the financial statements. Things like, have you got the most important components in your financial statements appearing up front in the accounting policies. Um, just now's a chance to really kind of say, have I given you know, the emphasis in the right place? And I suppose uh, determination. So yeah, uh, Commonwealth Games wouldn't be the same without uh, Usain Bolt. And uh, of course, this is you know, quite a familiar pose. And I was always kind of trying to figure out when this uh, photo uh, appeared, what he was pointing out to. And of course, he suddenly was uh, bringing attention to XYZ model financial statements. Sorry about that. But uh, it's also a case of uh, he probably uh, wanted to bring attention to Checkpoint. And Checkpoint is an important uh, follow on from dare I say, the hard copy of the model financial statements because what it is is Thomson Reuters digital platform for rendering up uh, model financial statements and technical support material. As you can see here, we've got um, the components as uh, they currently appear and all the hard copy material is also available in a digital format. So you say, well, why is that helpful? Well. The fact that also included in Checkpoint is the ability to get all the XRB standards. Those are the ones for for-profit, the public sector, and the not-for-profit ones. It allows all the, you know, the one search to be done all in the one place. And you've also, as we've got on the second bullet point, you no longer need to deal with the clunkiness of the you know, PDF in terms of doing the search because it is um, you know, basically coded up uh, in a way that you can look through and across different accounting standards and across the technical support material. You can also do a compare and contrast. What Checkpoint does is allow you to put any document into Word and then obviously with the functionality in Word, you can do a compare and contrast, get the uh, markup lighting and see from year to year what you might have to change in your accounting statements going forward. And I suppose last but by no means least, uh, Thompson Reuters working with the XRB are getting the accounting standards all up to date and loaded on a very timely basis. So it is continuous update just like you know, the website that the XRB sponsors. But the power is in being able to download so if you like something from XYZ Model Financial Statements, you can just simply click on the page, export it, and you've already got it formatted you know, for Word and ready to go. Certainly within our firm, it'll save quite a lot of time in terms of processing. So we've been talking uh, about uh, the processes, but uh, where does the rubber hit the road? Well, deadlines, penalties, and sanctions probably is uh, you know, an area which is worth quickly looking at. I was talking about for most uh, companies and New Zealand subsidiaries and overseas branches that we had a five month plus 20 working day regime. Now, we only have a five month regime. Gone is this uh, extra month. So be mindful of that. 
FMC uh, reporting entities actually have four months. Now, if you're on the stock exchange, you'll have actually three months you know, because of your listing requirements. But there are a fair number of uh, entities whereby the timeline will have been you know, tightened up. And this is important in the sense of uh, the company's office in particular is uh, reducing the tolerance for late filing and a bit more on that in a moment. The penalties have changed. Uh, again, you know, not wanting to get too much into the legal area, but where we had criminal penalties under the Financial Reporting Act, we've now got uh, civil actions that can be taken place. That's fine. Uh, in the sense of uh, the consequences might be slightly different. But what I think is important to recognise is not only have, from the individual point of view, the thresholds yeah, been increased you know, significantly, you know, um, up to a million dollars on each director individually. So if there are three of you running a company, um, you're in for significant uh, fines. But also this concept that the actual reporting entity itself is also um, subject to uh, sanction. And don't think that not-for-profits are uh, immune from this. Um, failure to uh, comply can bring penalties on trustees and members of governing body of registered charities of up to $50,000 per breach. All very real, very live, hard-wired into the legislation. And again, Checkpoint can allow you to access that information you know, through the uh, legislation uh, portal that's present there. So uh, look, um, you know, be mindful of uh, you know the penalties. Um, you know, if you really are determined to catch up with your uh, <laughs> reading in jail, uh, you still can be incarcerated for up to five years uh, and fines up to five hundred thousand for deliberate false and misleading. So look, it has to be premeditated, and dare I say, it's very rare that that would occur, but. What is important to note and has uh, caught out a few people already is that there's an immediate fine of $7,000 that's able to be imposed by the companies on late filing. You know, $7,000, basically an instant fine, that should hopefully make sure that you get your accounts filed on time with the Registrar of Companies. And so to some frequently asked questions, uh, you know, what's been coming across my desk? Well, uh, I thought a good place to start would be looking at 2013 and as we've gone into 2014, what are some of the most common errors that I've seen? Well, one which is subtle and you know, you know you're not going to go to jail for it, but I think a lot of people and organisations have perhaps not picked up that the term balance state is no longer parlance. It's not events after balance date in NZIS 10. It's events after the reporting date. And you know, when you use the term in reporting date, then you can talk about the interim reporting date, in which case you're under the auspices of 34, IES 34, or you've got you know, effectively the annual reporting date. And I do think that um, you know, getting that um, you know, terminology change is something that should be done, and that's certainly what we've reflected in the 2014 version of XYZ Model Financial Statements. I opened up the presentation with uh, some comments around uh, recycling of uh, the comprehensive income through profit and loss. Again, it is being overlooked in many instances. Again, the tier that you're reporting under should be in there. Again, very easy to do. Imputation credits. Now, uh, there have been changes in FRS 44, which has been around for some time, but effectively all you need now is to disclose the availability of imputation credits. It's no longer effectively calculated on a cash basis, and um, I suppose I just draw your attention to FRS you know, 44 in the sense of uh, the requirements you know, have changed. From an Australian perspective, um, you know, the alignment of uh, disclosure uh, is equivalent to what's in 10, AASB 1054. Uh, carrying on, capital management. Now, 
where a lot of people have perhaps um, fallen short of what the standard setters want is actually what defines capital? Is it just equity or is it equity plus embedded debt or some other definition of capital? But also, are there external financial covenants and have they been complied with, not only at balance state, but also uh, during the course of the year? That requirement is required under differential reporting, under RDR. Um, and whilst there are a lot of concessions in uh, RDR around financial instrument reporting, capital management disclosures is one of them where you really do need to talk about the external covenants. Clearly identifying the new accounting standards coming into force this year as opposed to accounting standards coming into effect in subsequent years. Uh, this probably applies more to the full tier one uh, reporter because of the concessions in RDR around um, not having to disclose accounting standards coming into effect in the future. That's optional and certainly I'd encourage it because um, you're both IFRS 9, which was issued in June and approved by the XRB just very recently, and 15, which deals with revenue recognition, might CO you know, affect uh, financial statement reporting. Disclosure of fees paid to the auditor, highlighted by the Financial Markets Authority in a special report they issued uh, earlier this year. They've given an interpretation of what FRS 44 requires, and. Again, it's not just the statutory fees to the auditor, it's what were the fees paid to the auditor for trustee reporting, what other controls reporting might they have done, break that all out as well as the tax and any other advisory services that might have been provided. And again, the FMA have brought attention to if there is going concern, then you need to fully report and disclose the material uncertainties that are giving rise to that and what decisions have been made by the reporting entity around going concern. There are both auditing and accounting requirements that come into play when dealing with um, going concern. Emphasis of matter um, is uh, frequently appropriate, but not always, um, again, uh, the devil's in the detail, but going concern can't be undercooked and perhaps should not always be the last accounting policy note appearing in a set of accounts. And to close out, two more points. Third balance sheet, if you change your accounting policies, you've got to come up with the third balance sheet. But the important thing is that the notes to the accounts only need to report the opening balance of last year, closing balance of last year, and closing balance of current year, for those balances that have changed. So if you went for uh, uh, reporting uh, change in accounting policy from amortized cost to revaluation for property, plant and equipment, uh, you would only need to provide the three balance sheet amounts and the movements there too in the property, plant and equipment standard. You may also um, have to have some consequential changes to deferred tax, but you know, receivables you wouldn't, payables you wouldn't, because of course they're not impacted at all by that accounting policy change. And I suppose uh, last but by no means least, in some people that have chosen to early adopt IFRS RDR, which is permissible right now uh, under the XRB framework, fully describing what the changes are. Uh, again, IFRS 1 provides the outline, and I have to say that um, the disclosures are challenging and don't undercook the amount of editing that will be required to get a reporting solution that's appropriate you know, for your business. So going back you know, to uh, Glasgow, um, uh, you know, I appreciate that accounting standards is not you know, the most exciting topic out there. And um, I always think that there's always room for a caption contest and recognising that we are talking about the Commonwealth Games, I couldn't help but note on day two that there was this photo of uh, the Queen and Prince Philip at the hockey game actually involving New Zealand and they were having a conversation. And I think the question might be, yeah, well dear, what uh, potential new sporting codes do you think we should suggest for the Games? 
and you can imagine, you know, Philip uh, you know, gave it a great deal of consideration and photobombing uh, would probably be suggested. And of course, uh, you know, they'd probably do quite well within the family because uh, guess what? We've got Harry appearing here in terms of uh, the photobomb and coincidentally with the uh, Kiwi team. But I think even the Queen quite you know, like this because when it comes to photobombing, just uh, you know, look at her here. Uh, the Australian uh, team, and yep, there you can see in the left-hand side, you know, the Queen uh, wanting to make uh, her appearance there. Look, photobombing uh, perhaps uh, you know, may not end up being an official code, but uh, certainly you have to do something to brighten up the world of financial reporting. But back to some more frequently asked questions. Now, one of them is around overseas ownership and that 25% threshold that was um, and still is a part. Notice this has moved from the Financial Reporting Act 93 into the Companies Act, and it's obviously been amended with Section 207. But what I particularly wanted to draw your attention to is this definition of not ordinarily resident. Now, there's often been a taxation spend put to you know, this amount. Well, I'm pleased to say that we now have ordinarily resident actually defined in the uh, legislation itself. It basically says, where have you been living for the immediate uh, 12 months? If you've been for an offshore holiday, that doesn't necessarily relieve you from you know, the residency. So um, at least some clarity in there, and that's quite important because there are a lot of high wealth Kiwis who do own New Zealand companies, and the question is, you know, what should their company reporting be? Now this one, and I use orange here um, only because I got caught out. In the regime, I've been talking about the 10 million and the 20 million, but the fundamental point is that differential reporting, talk about the 10 million and the 20 million, but note this, that the 20 million under the new regime going forward relates to assets, whereas the 20 million under old DIFREP related to revenues. And similarly, the swap between assets, it was only 10 million under old differential reporting, it's 20 million going forward. And this test of full-time equivalency kind of dies going forward in this definition of large. I suppose, just be careful out there. Uh, <laughs> even someone who's very closely uh, with the uh, counting standards can be ankle tapped, and this was one which I was recently. What is large? Well, the public benefit entities aren't driven by those asset thresholds or by those revenue thresholds, by, but by expenditure. Again, these are all fully explained and elaborated in the XRB um, website. And uh, what we will be doing is um, looking to provide you know, support and guidance, particularly around tier one and tier two reporting going forward, recognizing that in contrast to companies, the XRB has come out with template guidance to govern not-for-profits and public sector entities that have operating expenditure between 2 million and 125,000 and below 125,000. And notice that recurring theme for the last two preceding years. Why two? Because you don't want that one year blip because of an insurance recovery or huge donation coming through. New Zealand branches. Again, what basis of accounting? Very important this, that it has to be prepared in accordance with New Zealand GAAP. That is you know, the branch. And uh, that is quite specific. Now, what also needs to be recognized is uh, that you know, that branch has to be audited along with the overseas company, or if that overseas company is not audited, that overseas group uh, financial statements subject to audit or being audited is what replaces it. But most importantly, we have had, and for example, in New Plymouth, uh, there will be many entities whereby the preparation of branch and uh, 
overseas company accounts will have been on the basis of Australian or US GAAP. Well, at the moment, you can't do that. And whilst I expect that to move on, it will be a case of what's the space for the um, changing uh, basis, if there is to be a changing basis, of preparing financial statements for branches in accordance with New Zealand GAAP. Also, I suppose um, what we've got to be mindful of is, well, if I'm not in that large criteria and I'm in that special purpose financial reporting, what's going down? Well, the key thing is you are not exempt from not having to prepare financial statements. The Income Tax Administration Act 94 basically brings you into that space. So don't create the impression that um, completion of an IR10 without a set of accounts behind it is the way to go. That's not the intention at all. But special purpose financial reporting, uh, and Zika spent you know, 18 months uh, trying to come up with a set of guidelines. It's focused around meeting the demands of these users, banks, owners, directors, and if you were to purchase or sell the business, providing sufficient information to, I suppose, make an informed buy-sell decision, and obviously inland revenue, who are recognised and uh, they acknowledge they are the largest consumer of financial statements and uh, financial reporting in the country. So, the Financial Reporting Act um, for smaller businesses um, and the special purpose reporting, uh, you now go to the Tax Administration Act. There are some compulsory minimum requirements. There are speed guidance, um, uh, guidelines that have been issued by NZICA or Chartered Accountants Australia and New Zealand now and um, that really what you're doing is preparing financial statements to support the modified IR10. Of course how complete is uh, the special purpose financial reporting? Pretty good but where there are gaps effectively one will need to default you know, to IFRS. And it's all about preparing one set of financial statements that could be used in multi-sectors or multiple you know, circumstances. And what we have are three sets of illustrative financial statements available on the Chartered Accountants website. Got one for products, one for services, and one for agricultural entities. In other words, farms or vineyards. <laughs> um, and uh, I believe that going forward, if you are to refer to those, it is a case of kind of pick and mix, much like your supermarket trolley, and pull out the relevant items. What is important to recognise in those illustrative financial statements, if you've not had a chance to look at them, is that they identify what I call the core components, because they align with the minimum reporting requirements of inland revenue, with the non-core components, you know, those elements which are probably significant, but uh, uh, not uh, always required in every set of accounts going forward. So, the Special Purpose Financial Reporting Framework, 27 sections, just over 100 pages long if you include the glossary. And just like we had with old Kiwi Gap, starts with you know, defining what is an asset, what is a liability, what is revenue, what is expense. And then how do you look about presenting that in terms of uh, current, non-current, and then what are the principal financial statements? Only two. One is uh, the balance sheet. The other one is statement of profit or loss. And then obviously accounting policies you know, follow on from there. Then you've got each of these uh, areas. Um, they are kind of self-contained. Uh, I think that they're a reasonably easy read. Um, there are, you know, if there's a chapter to focus in on, it might be this one on impairment of assets because a real focus has been on trying to come up with a mechanism and a solution that is cost efficient. But let's face it, the way in which financial statements can most 
dare I say, go wrong, is when assets aren't reported at their fair value or an appropriate value, they are being subject to impairment, and so a great deal of focus on that. And uh, there will be a um, you know, roadshow provided by um, Enzika uh, that will take uh, place, and uh, there will be support materials coming out from Enzika, and uh, I encourage you, you know, to go to those. In terms of the minimum inland revenue requirements, hopefully this is a recap uh, for you, uh, but just in case uh, you haven't focused on what will be required from uh, 2015 uh, onwards, in other words, 31 March 2015, tax returns and the like, balance sheet, p &L, accounting policies, you can use any of the specified appropriate tax values, so there's a range of sources you can go to. You will have to reconcile what's in your account with what you've actually got in your tax return. You will need to show the change in equity, the shareholders' funds. You will need a set of accounts that basically disclose all the inland revenue uh, IR10 data points. Sufficient notes to describe exceptional items. Now, exceptional items, I suppose, are new in this space. They're the unusual, non-recurring items. The extraordinary item, which we used to have. Possibly the abnormal item. I suppose what's different in um, the Special Purpose Financial Reporting Guidelines, as opposed to the IR10, is that in the IR10, that's a net number, whereas um, in special purpose financial reporting, if it's exceptional income, you've got to put it there. If it's exceptional expense, you've got to put it there. Then, and this is important to recognise, and perhaps you now need to gather the information now, is that certainly for uh, tax returns in the 15-16 uh, fiscal year, you're going to have to have a schedule of specified associate person transactions. A schedule doesn't need to be part of the accounts, but it needs to um, you know, fully report what's going on and obviously imputation credits. Just picking up this schedule, this next slide basically can be summarised you know, this way. The Inland Revenue wants to know what you're doing with other people and it wants to know what dealings are going on offshore. And so all of those um, transactions associated with the entity, interest, loans, financial support, services provided, leasing arrangements, arrangements built around uh, transfer billing of intellectual property. That's what's got to be you know, documented. It's really uh, for the preparer of financial statements to determine how to gather that information and report it. But um, my suggestion is get that there. Note also that you know, this whole area of related parties is one where things can go wrong and uh, that in many ways you can't undercook it in terms of preparation and identification. Uh, the minimum reporting requirements, I suppose uh, what is interesting is uh, when you've got companies uh, with revenue or expenses less than 30,000, they're exempt. Um, I still think you've got to follow the, you know, the tax requirements, but I just draw that uh, to your attention. Non-active companies, as you would expect, are non-exempt. And again, financial reporting can be done in a variety of ways. As long as you've got the financial statements here, you've got supporting schedules here, there is that package supporting the IR10 over there, then you've really got you know, the you know, kind of component ingredients. And I think that that's you know, really um, the way forward. And so we're just about there, ladies and gentlemen, some closing remarks. <coughs> We've covered a lot of uh, material, and you know, how does one kind of bring this all together? Well, I suppose the fact is that financial statements, even under this new regime, will still need to be prepared. And the key is to make sure that when there are timelines specified in reporting uh, legislation that they are followed. Notice that in the enabling legislation, partnerships, for example, are now caught by the Financial Reporting Act. 
2013. They weren't by the old 1993 Act. So I cannot underestimate the importance of reviewing not only the Financial Reporting Act 2013, but the enabling legislation. There will be changes to uh, current formats. Even in the Special Purpose Financial Reporting Guidelines, they want a description of the company. So if you've got a company like Yellow Diamond Limited, but it actually changes tyres, you've actually got to say that I'm running you know, a retail operation changing tyres. You know, you have nothing to do with you know, prospecting diamonds and wonderful locations. And you, I suppose, check uh, where you are and uh, use, hopefully, the resources uh, that are available. Certainly, in working alongside Thomson Reuters, uh, we hope that we'll be able to provide you with a very you know, complete uh, set of tools with which to deal with you know, the transition. And I do think uh, you know, some care is required. You know, we need to be mindful of uh, the consequences of non-compliance. Uh, those principles of public accountability, economic significance, uh, they are there for a reason and the government and the policy advisors to government have made it very clear that uh, if you're captured, they want full, complete and very transparent reporting. So just like the Commonwealth Games, finishing off you know, with uh, you know, Celtic Stadium here, um, hopefully there won't be fireworks going off. Uh, and uh, you know, as they always say, these were the best games ever. Many, many photos you know, get taken and every one of them is unique. Every business is unique. Every set of accounts in many ways is you know, unique, it's bespoke. And hopefully you, know, you won't be underwater you know, for too long and uh, you, know, you can kind of, like this backstroker, cut your way through the water and uh, get to your destination quickly. In delivering the best games only, well, hopefully, you know, just like we did in the cycling, we can end up you know, with uh, gold medals being uh, effectively the goal. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your time in listening you know, to this video. If you have any comments or questions, uh, please feel free to uh, send them uh, through to me and there will be contact uh, details. Uh, associated uh, with this video at, and also on the website. Uh, we will take those comments and feedbacks and work them into updated uh, newsletters and the like that support XYZ model financial statements. So once again, thank you for your time. I hope that there's been some uh, insight given into you know, the framework for financial reporting and I look forward to to uh, working alongside you and updating you in the future with further briefings such as this. Thank you very much.